So what we do is record it. That way we'll send it to all of you as, uh, as recording. We also keep these all archived on the public part of our uh, YouTube channel. So if you ever wanna go back and look at some of the others, uh, learn some more about different lenders and so forth, that's always a great way for you to be able to do it. Uh, my name's Danny Fitzgerald. I'm with the San Diego and Imperial Small Business Development Center. Uh, we're happy to have, uh, this is our regular Meet the Lenders. Today, we're actually gonna talk specifically about uh, lending for government contracts or private or large corporate contracts because uh, that's oftentimes a challenge and has some unique situations behind it uh, but we but what's been great is as we've seen over the past five years really uh, the marketplace grow to a number of good lenders that can work with businesses uh, with their contracting situations and, and that's been really exciting and so um, you know so again we're going to have a good panel today uh, discussing that and uh, we certainly are happy to have everybody the small business development center as a reminder we're here to be able to help you at no cost uh, we have a wide array of experts be able to help you with of course lending uh, with government contracting with marketing and many other situations that uh, that probably would be very beneficial to you and wait you know things that that, that are going to be critical uh the, the meet the lenders is a monthly series that we have uh, we do do a couple in person here in the san diego region but most of the time these are online uh, that allows people like andrew who's up in the bay area to be able to be on on these calls and uh and other ones from around the country so we want to thank our sponsors for this which is cdc small business finance Marble Bridge Funding, United Midwest Savings, Pacific Premier, LendSpark, Primary Funding, Founders First Capital, Civic Communities, and Banner Bank. Um, and so uh, what I want to kick off first is, Ali, you ready to share the video that the SBA sent us? So they are our, our primary uh, stakeholder. So they have a, a couple of updates they were unable to join. So they did send this and record this as well. OK. Um, can you see, is it my desktop you see, or is it the video? We see the video. Perfect. Yep. Okay, great. Give me a minute and I'm just gonna make sure that I can share the sound. Good morning. I'm Lisa Montgomery from your same. Sorry, guys, I think it's not sharing the sound. It was. It was? Okay, perfect. Great. <laughs> you know, the district office of the SBA. Thank you to the SBDC for hosting this amazing event. Likely you're here for one or two reasons. First, you either have a government contract and you're needing some funding to get it going, or two, you would like to contract with the government. Starting with number two, is your business ready to contract with the government? Do you have federal contracting experience? Do you know where to find contracting opportunities? Are you capable of fulfilling a government contract? And most importantly, does the government buy what you sell? If yes, then an SBA certification may help you land that contract. SBA contracting programs include the 8A development program, the Hub Zone program, the Women Owned Small Business program, and the Service Disabled Veteran Owned program. Why get certified? Because the government is required to use small businesses for a portion of its purchases for a goal of 23%. 5% women owned, 5% small disadvantaged businesses, 3% hot zone, and 3% service disabled veteran small businesses are the goals. If you are looking for government contracts and for help with certification, please contact your SBDC advisor. They'll put it in the chat of how to reach them. That's the best way to start. Now, if you already have a government contract and you're needing some funding, you're in a great place here. Even with a government contract, you need to qualify with a lender. So the SBA doesn't loan directly unless it's a disaster loan. So it's a great time that you're here and we're thankful for the SBDC for hosting this webinar. 
how can the SBA help? How the SBA helps is we work with the lenders with what's called a loan guarantee. Because the SBA backs the loan, the lender can offer more loans with competitive rates and more flexible underwriting. The applicant, that's you, the business owner, does not need to do anything. You can use your SBA funds for these types of loans to grow or expand your business and help you work that contract. Your likely loan will be our flagship program, the 7A loan. If you're purchasing real estate to build out your, your company for your government contract, a 504 loan may work for you for real estate. If it's under $50,000, a micro loan will work for you. You can go it alone and use our lender match if you like, but we find substantially better success if you work with your SBDC mentor for help. They can help you with the business plan, expense sheets, and financials. Thank you so much for taking this time. We appreciate it. Please reach out to us if we can be of any assistance and listen closely to these lenders. Awesome. So yeah, so the SBA, they, they certainly are a big help for, for all of these things. And uh, Lucy, she unfortunately couldn't join us today, uh, but we, you know, the district office has been fantastic. They do a lot to support government contracting with a lot of their goals too. So, uh, you know, reach out to us. We can definitely get you in contact with that. So we're going to, without much further ado, we're going to kind of get to our panel um, and I'll have each of them start to introduce themselves. And we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Andrew. Thank you, Danny. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Crone. I'm Senior VP with Marble Bridge Funding Group. We are a direct lender commercial finance company located up in um, Walnut Creek, California. We lend throughout the state. We specialize in accounts receivable, purchase order, and contract finance. Um, we have no minimum, so we can lend up to um, $5 million a month, and um, I've been doing it 21 years. I've worked with all sorts of lenders, including lenders on this panel, and um, would be glad to talk to anyone about any need they have if they're a receivable-based business. Fantastic. And Oscar from Founders First. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. My name is Oscar Franco. I work for a company called Founders First Capital Partners. Our headquarters are here in San Diego. We are a national lender. We have a revenue-based fund and a mission lender as well. So a little backstory. So Founders First, our vision is to level the playing field for underrepresented founders. Um, so we provide that with basically two entities. One is our nonprofit, where we run accelerator programs. And the other arm of Founders First is our, is our investment arm, which is Founders First Capital Partners. Um, Essentially, what we do is we focus on business models that has uh, that have a recurring revenue. So we do have a lot of experience working with companies that have government contracts as well. Uh, happy to answer any questions you may have, and um, yeah, excited to be here. So thank you, thank you to everyone. All right, Pete with Lenspark. How are you doing, Danny? Thanks for having me here, SBDC. My name is Pete Deegan. I'm with Lenspark. We help small and medium-sized businesses with their equipment financing needs, um, as well as working capital solutions for basically any situation that comes up where their bank can't help them out due to you know, credit or some other unforeseen circumstance. And we really like to help work with your bank to kind of bridge the gaps and help your business grow and get to the next level. Ultimately, keeping a good relationship with your bank and, and other lenders here on the panel as well. Um, happy to answer any questions anyone has and talk. Okay. And DeWitt with Pacific Premier. Thanks, Danny. I'm DeWitt with Pacific Premier Bank. I'm a SVP with the bank. We're headquartered in Irvine. Uh, we focus on commercial banking for small, medium, and large size businesses. And we offer lines of credit, term loans, real estate financing, um, starting as small as 5000 and going up to north of a hundred million. Uh, yep, that's up. Thank you, Danny. And Fernando with Primary Funding. Good morning. Yeah, Fernando Ponce with Primary Funding. Uh, so we're San Diego based uh, company here doing alternative finance. We've been in San Diego for about 27 years now. Uh, we provide 
asset-based uh, lending services, so factoring, purchase order finance. Uh, we will do some bridge lending and lines of credit as well. Um, but really, for us, ultimately, it's all about: Do you have AR? Do you have POs? What can we What can we leverage on the on the business side? And are there contracts that we can use to mobilize you? Um, typically, we're dealing with clients that aren't bankable. However, we um, you know, our goal is to get you to bankability. So we don't have contracts. Everything we do is month to month. And ideally, we're going to work with you for six months, a year, maybe two years, and then eventually get you back to a, a banking partner. Fantastic. And Gustavo with Civic. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Gustavo Bedart with Civic Communities, um, which is a two-tier organization. Civic Communities is Civic Ventures and Civic Community Partners. I, I'm talking today about Civic Community Partners, which is a CDFI, it's a community lender. Uh, we specialize in new markets tax credits, um, housing and finan financing, housing construction and development for affordable housing. And for the purpose of today, we also do our building business success program, which has two components, a capacity building program to help you understand how to better position yourself to procure. And then we also provide uh, working capital and we'll provide working capital from 50,000 to a half a million dollars. Um, and the purpose of the loan is obviously so that you can fulfill your contracts that you might be awarded through uh, some of the sources, anchor institutions. Here we're talking about you know, municipal government anchor institutions. And I've already put my contact information in the chat if you uh, wanna write that down. Happy to answer any additional questions standing when the time is right. Thank you. Fantastic, all right. So, you, you know, you can see it's a wide array of different types of lenders and each of you work with uh, companies as they're getting government contracts, but each have kind of different different needs, different times and, and different way, products that would necessarily work. Um, so I'm going to kind of go around and just kind of if you can specifically talk about how yours would work if someone was able to obtain either a large corporate contract, you know, say something like if they got something from Google or from something like a governmental entity, the federal government or a local government or the state government. Uh, so Pete, can you talk a little bit about that, your product specifically? Yeah, so I, I guess one of our most uh, popular products, the equipment financing when it comes to government municipal contracts, uh, what's really popular for us to do is sometimes, for instance, I, I have a client that does a lot of motor grading, uh, like paving for highways and stuff, and just kind of grading out miles and miles in uh, Arizona. We are a nationwide lender. Um, so we'll match up the terms of the equipment financing to their contract. So if they get a three-year contract for, for grading, we'll get them on a 36-month term. And in most cases, we're going to be cheaper to finance that asset than the rental costs nowadays. So that's really popular utilization of our equipment financing product, as well as uh, something like currently, you know, even when you get the uh, disaster down in Florida, I have a couple of longtime customers that, you know, need financing right away on some equipment and we're able to move very fast. So in certain situations where, you know, they're, you know, we need to move and close within a couple of days. We're also able to do that with both working capital and equipment. Fantastic. And Oscar, same question to you. Yeah. So we are a little bit different. I would say the use of funds for us um, is primarily depending on the company what on, on, and their needs. So, a few examples we got companies use our funds for working capital, uh, equipment, uh, uh, hiring some um, key employees to the companies to continue to fulfill their contracts. Um, so revenue based financing in that sense is a little bit flexible. Um, usually just to give you an idea, we focus solely on the business performance. So any new contracts will be great, obviously, but if the, car if the company has current contracts as well, we also can take that into consideration. Um, Usually the companies that we work with are in business for a little bit over 12 months to 18 months. Um, revenues around 450 to 500 K in annual revenue. Um, so we don't do any work with early stage companies. I know probably other uh, lenders in here do work with that kind of companies. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, we also, I mean, it's not a, it's not necessarily, but for those that are seeking in, in some, some knowledge and resources to grow their business or potentially get access to more government contracts on our accelerator programs, we do offer workshops and courses for that specifically. And also, if you're interested, as the SBA video was saying, if you're interested about certifications, we do have a lot of experience and mentors and, and consultants here at Founders First that can walk you through getting a certification as well, uh, which is very important as well for government contracts. Um, 
So yeah, any any more specifics you want me to share? Or I'm sure we no, have a lot of more questions. Yeah, that's good. We got more questions, yeah. Oscar. Andrew, same to you. So how does your yours fit within in government contracts? So for the 24 years we've been around, we've been on government contracts from the beginning, whether they paid local or federal government contracts. Um, I have a lot of clients currently that are involved with that. Um, clients who have um, contracts via as a subcontractor in a lot of cases where they are dealing with a federal or a prime that's working on a federal contract and somebody who are funding um, that was doing the um, high-speed rail. Um, we've had companies that we were funding that work for um, GCs or primes that are working uh, for Cal you know, Caltrans highways. Slightly right in 0.2 miles. We we have clients also um, that are a lot of them are uh, disabled vets that we've been funding, and they're providing products to the um, federal government, sometimes the state government, and the federal government works with our industry receivable finance all the time, as do the state agencies. So they all work with us. One of the biggest challenges. Um, whether you're offering a product or a service to federal government is if you're successful in landing a contract, it really becomes very difficult to figure out sometimes um, how you're going to fund it. Um, because there's usually a timing issue when you have to hire a lot of people, when you have to make payroll, and when you have to um, provide um, the products. And so um, on the product side in particular, um, a lot of vendors don't want to give terms, especially to younger companies. We're able to write letters of financial commitment, um, which serve two purposes. One is to negotiate um, with your vendors so they can see that you have a line of credit that's substantial and we could write up to five million a month in that letter and that makes you look a lot larger and allows you to um, get better terms typically and a lot of government contracts a portion of them um, also require proof that you have the financial resources to do it and if you're a small company that's sort of hard to do we're able again to write that letter which has allowed people to land large contracts and because it's receivable finance they could bill daily or bill weekly or bill monthly whatever the terms we could fund those invoices and on occasion we work with clients on purchase orders as well i'm helping get the money um, up front to pay the vendor if need be fantastic okay. and dewitt for their pacific premier for financing government contracts yeah, so with us, um, typically a business will have a two-year track record servicing, profitably servicing smaller contracts uh, before they actually would qualify to become a lending client. Um, and kind of like what, what Andrew mentioned, the, the challenge with a lot of businesses that pursue government contracts, you know, you, you get awarded a contract and, and you think, awesome, this is great. I've got, you know, this nice large government contract. But then the challenge becomes, like Andrew mentioned, well, now how do I fund the contract? How do I, you know, find enough capital to hire people, buy materials, put everything together and deliver on it? Uh, because the reality is if you get awarded a government contract and you do not perform on the contract, you know, according to whatever the, the specs are, um, you could get blacklisted and, and, you know, find that it's very, very tough to get awarded contracts in the future. So with me, I don't do any startups. So typically a business will have a two year track record. And during that two years, they're profitably servicing smaller contracts. And then maybe a time comes where they realize, you know, if we had a couple hundred thousand or a couple million on a line of credit, maybe that would allow us to go after a higher volume of contracts or maybe it would allow us to now pursue much larger contracts. Um, so typically that's, that's when I get looped in once they have a two-year track record, they've been profitably going after contracts and now they wanna either borrow money from the bank on a line of credit to go after a higher volume of contracts, maybe similarly sized or go after larger contracts. The, the challenge for businesses that you know, I've been going after those smaller contracts for a while. I'll, I'll give everyone a quick story. Um, a new client of mine that provides the military uh, with various apparel. So, you know, think clothing, think, you know, travel goods for the military, for the Army Marines. Uh, they've been doing it for quite a while and they're excited now. And this is a, a $4 million company. So they do $4 million a year profitable. 
but now they might be awarded a $50 million contract. And they're thinking, oh, this is awesome. We might get a $50 million contract. But then they reached out to me to find out, you know, is, is it possible for us to get a line of credit to support the working capital needs to deliver on a $50 million contract? And unless they have that successful track record of going after similarly sized contracts, it probably would be tough for me to, you know, give them a 30, 40 million dollar line of credit when it's only a four million dollar company. Um, so cases like that, it's probably a better fit for, for one of the non-bank lenders. But again, with me, two year track record, successfully, profitably going after, you know, similarly sized contracts. And now the business wants to borrow anywhere from 5,000 to 100 million to either go after a higher volume or larger size contracts. Fantastic. Thanks, DeWitt. And that's important is kind of to understand, and, and DeWitt summed that up well, that the different lenders are going to fit you ba based on different times of, you know, or based of your experience or things like that. So, Fernando, same question to you kind of in terms of, you know, someone's getting a government contract. What are the products you have to, to be able to help them service that? Yeah, the most commonly used for us with, with government is, is going to be our factoring program, where we're essentially just financing your invoices at a discount. Um, and so that's for completed work. You've already done it. You're waiting, you know, 30, 60, 90 days to get paid. And it acts similar. I've seen many people talk about line of credit. It acts very similar to a line of credit in that it's revolving, but it is tied to specific invoices. Um, and so it's a little bit more restrictive, but it can scale just like a, you know, a little bit better than the line of credit actually. And then for procurement, we typically end up using our PO facilities. And so that's on the front end. You're uh, going to procure a product for a government agency. You know, it could be paper clips, wh whatever, right? And you you don't have the capital maybe to go out and, and, and pay for that on the front end if you're not getting terms from your vendor, or maybe the terms from your vendor are only 30 days and you're gonna get paid on 60 or 90. So you've got a gap there anyway. And that's where our PO financing can come in and, and really help you on the front end to mobilize on those contracts. Fantastic. And Gustavo, Civic's doing a lot now with this. So how, how does your... <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Danny. So basically we're not, as a community development uh, financial institution, a CDFI, we're a nonprofit organization trying to be a little more lenient than the conventional institution. So, um, you know, our our con our lending is not FICO based, obviously, you know, this is more make sense lending based on the uh, contract being procured. So a percentage of whatever will keep you um, the, the bar worthy the awardee, if you will, afloat to kind of carry over the burden of being paid 30, 60, 90 days. That's the mission of our lending, right? How can we help you capitalize your, your working capital so that you can, um, you know, wait out the storm to get paid? Now, most of the companies that come to us have been looking for uh, how do they build up to fulfill their contracts? So, you know, the, be able to purchase materials or equipment. Um, real case scenario that one that we're working on today, a gentleman is hiring more staff. He got a contract with the Homeland Security and for the refugee intake. So he has to build up a, a small army. So in this case, you know, we were able to use this contract as an example of what was when he's coming in. We validated the contract. We're currently underwriting it uh, just for his capacity, you know, to make the payment um, because of the contract. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to fund that within the next week or two. Um, the idea here is, you know, how can we inject capital? to the needs of the awardee, right? To be able to procure, fulfill uh, the contract. Um, one of the things I'll add also, Danny, um, this is the only building, this is the only business building program we have. And so with this, we also provide technical assistance. So as many of the folks here on the panel will agree, a lot of folks who are involved for the first time or just kind of nascent to the idea of getting contracts with government, there's a lot of issues with um, compliance. And so we do have a specialized training similar to what PTAC has there at close to you, your neighbor, of what it really entails, right? From a compliance perspective and to position themselves to once you get an award, these are public funds, right? You have to be very careful with how you spend the monies and, um, and the results uh, of the contract. So we provide that training. Uh, we're going to ha actually have a veterans training on November 16th to teach uh, that group of demographic, if you will, how to procure with federal, state, and local municipalities. And we'll go into greater detail uh, on, our, on our loan program, as well, as well as you know, compliance issues and capacity issues when you're dealing with government money. Fantastic, thanks, Gustavo. Thank you, Dan. So 
going to kind of com combine a couple of things, but I think it's an important kind of conversation of understanding kind of timings and then the process. Um, so when I'm getting a government contract from a business and do I approach you during, you know, prior to even bidding on it, while I'm bidding on it, after or after I've obtained the contract, and then what is kind of your underwriting process in, in terms of the timing as well along with that. And uh, why, why don't we go ahead and start with uh, with you, Fernando, on that? Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a catch twenty two, right? So we ideally we're, we're involved on the front end, um, and a big thing that, that I will say is when you submit these bids, there's a little box on government, uh, you know, contracting that that's assignability. The assignability you, you need to make sure that that's checked off anytime you bid on these contracts because if they if you don't do that, you win the contract, then you go to get financing from a company like, like myself that's you know leveraging the invoices or the POs. We need to have the payment assigned to us. And if that little box isn't checked off, you have to go back to the contracting officer and get it amended. And that creates a whole issue or it can happen, but it just adds complexity to the deal. So if you, when you're bidding, if you just check that box that says it's assignable, um, and, and you win the bid that way, then you're, you're going to be, it's going to make it so much easier for you. So that's one thing I'll, I'll say, but, um, it's really hard for us to assess contracts until you have them. So what we can do is we can provide, you know, a letter of intent or an LOI, um, to help you in the bidding process. Uh, unfortunately that is not a guarantee of financing. And a lot of what we, uh, what we decide on is, is, you know, who the contracts with, what the payment terms are. Uh, and so we can't really see that until we go through the contract and read that. So that's why I say it's a little bit of a catch-22. We can provide you something that says we're interested and, and we're, you know, probably going to be able to finance you based on the type of co of, uh, of contracts you're working on and historically what you've been doing. Um, but we won't be able to actually give you a commitment to finance until we're able to see the contract. So we do want to be involved early. Uh, unfortunately, the level of commitment won't really be there until we're able to finally read through the final contract and make sure it's something we can finance. Fantastic. And and Oscar, same sort of thing to you, or either it can be- Yeah, I would say kind of the same. Yeah, and I agree with everything that Fernando said, but, but yes, it's, it, it will be kind of hard for us to analyze um, a potential loan if we don't get access to the contract, review the details, look at the payments. Um, given that basically our- 100% of our uh, underwriting process and, and our investment criteria is based out of your company and, and, and the company's performance. So it's essentially the same as Fernando. We need, we need to have the contract. And once you have that, then we can definitely have a, a further on conversation. Cool. And then Pete, of course, yours is focused more on the equipment. So kind of when, you know, when after they get the contract and then a little bit on the underwriting process. Yeah, and again, I touched on this a little bit uh, earlier that, that obviously you'd come to us for your, you know, excavators and your dump trucks that you need for a certain project that you've been, been awarded. Um, but I, I guess what also makes LendSpark unique in, in a different way than maybe your, your banker or even some other lenders out there is our ability to underwrite and fund a loan within two to three business days if need be. Um, that goes for cash, so we can, you know, get half half a million dollars, you know, even 100k done, you know, one to two business days if need be. So for your last minute needs or in project kind of some situation comes up as it does more often than not, we're able to kind of help smooth uh, smooth things over for you a little bit there. Um, and and yeah, like I said, it, it it is about a two to three day process most times. If you really need to, we can get it done in one or two. Um, but we don't need to really look at the contract itself. We're not really looking at at really the contract or, or, or anything of that nature. We're more digging into the time and business and the financials of the company. So we're really more focused on our customer, which which kind of helps us if you're working with, you know, a Fernando at primary funding and, and getting some factoring done. Maybe you come for us for equipment and maybe another hundred grand you need to finish up something down the road. So I think if you work together with everybody on this panel, um, everybody's kind of got a little bit of a niche to, to help out. But I'd say our speed is definitely what sets us apart. Fantastic. And then DeWitt, they're a Pacific premier with the, with the bank, you know, kind of what, you know, when do they really approach you, you know, depending on what they're, they're get doing and they kind of a little bit on the underwriting process and timing. Yeah. So um, going back to that, profitable, successful track record that we would require. So 
two years in business. Um, I would say that's kind of about the minimum that we would need to see as far as how long the business has successfully been going after contracts, winning contracts, and profiting from them. Um, as far as when in the process should they reach out to us or first reach out to the SBDC and, and then reach out to us, is it when they're in the RFP process, once it's been awarded? Um, with us, since we're looking at your historical track record, um, I would really say once you've actually demonstrated an ability to go after those contracts, service those contracts, and either, you know, previously, maybe you're working with a non-bank lender to obtain capital to service those contracts, and you did that for the first two, three years um, of the business being incorporated or formed. And at that point, you say, well, maybe we think, you know, we've been making all of this profit. Maybe we should be qualified for a bank line of credit instead of a non-bank line. And, and the difference, you know, the, the biggest difference is probably going to be the interest rate. So a non-bank line might have a higher interest rate. Bank debt is usually going to be the cheapest debt out there. So once you have that successful track record, and maybe you've been working with a non-bank lender for years, going after those contracts, factoring the AR, you know, using like a lens spark for equipment if you have equipment needs. And then three years down the line, you realize, wow, we made, you know, a couple hundred thousand last year. We made a hundred grand in profit the year before. Can't we, can't we qualify now for a bank loan or a bank line of credit and, you know, do so with a much lower interest rate? So that's usually when I would get looped on. Once the company has that two, three or longer year track record and they either want access to more capital or want to transition from a non-bank financing facility to, to bank financing. That's when I'm looped in. What does the actual underwriting process look like? Um, so with, with Pacific Premier Bank up to 500,000, uh, we're willing to do completely unsecured. And for everyone on, on the call today, what, what does that mean if a bank or a lender says unsecured? It basically means there's no hard, tangible collateral that we're taking in exchange for offering that credit. So in other words, you know, there's real estate collateral, there's accounts receivables as collateral, there's brokerage accounts, which can be collateral. Um, so up to 500,000, we don't require any collateral. So the underwriting process, let's say you've been in business for two years and you're not quite profitable. Can I do something for you? The most would be a 50,000 line of credit, and that's provided you have a 740 or higher credit score, and you fill out a one-page application, I check your credit score, 740 or higher, you should qualify for 50,000. Uh, 740 or lower, you should qualify for 25,000. And that, that, again, that's with zero profitability. So that's before you've actually started to net a profit on an annual basis you could get up to a $50,000 line. Um, let's say, you know, you've been around for a couple of years and you're profitable, then you could get up to 500,000. Uh, the items that we would look at in the underwriting process, it's really three, maybe four main items. So your most recent filed business tax return or your most recent year-end business financials, year-to-date business financials, and a couple months of bank statements. Those are the only documents that, that we use um, in the underwriting process. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward, you know, underwriting process. The, these loans, up to, loans and lines up to 500,000 typically take two weeks uh, for, you know, underwriting. So in other words, if someone applied today, I'll have a credit decision for you in less than two weeks. And if you're approved, then you should be able to close, sign loan docs, get access to the money in about three weeks, which is pretty fast for a bank. Um, but non-bank lenders typically can even move faster than that. And that's, uh, that's it for me. Thanks, DeWitt, appreciate that. And Andrew, question to you, kind of timing on when they come to you and your underwriting process. So I'm gonna go to the underwriting process first. Um, if we've spoken together 
And since I do the underwriting, <clears throat> figure it out whether we can do the deal or not within a phone call or maybe a phone call and a couple documents sent to me. So um, since I do it, I usually close about 99% of the um, clients that come in that want funding. So we do that very, very quickly. But as far as a total package, if you get me everything I need, similar to what a bank may ask for, financials, tax returns, um, and I have it all in my hand, you probably have you funded within five days typically. Um, on the process, you have really two types of clients that we see, especially from a lot of SBDC referrals. We have a lot of startups that are young going after government contracts. So um, from the underwriting side, it's pretty simple because there's no history. So it's probably going to be a yes. Um, but um, and then you have established businesses on the other side that do have um, receivables now. They are working. They have been in business for several years, and um, that's a little bit easier as a process as far as the funding side because they have options as far as trying to fund the business because they have receivables which they could fund right now. But I would say to anybody who's looking to go after government contracts or anybody in business, I think you have to talk to the lenders first. I think you have to um, get experience from all of us on this panel, talk to everybody and learn what their programs are and how the program would work and how, you know, what kind of funding capacity they have, how fast they can move. Um, as an example, we get a lot of um, businesses that are going after government contracts and there are going to be um, construction. And most people in my industry don't carry that category. We do. We've been doing it um, for the 24 year period we've been here. So we do progress billing, milestone billing. Um, so if you're speaking to me specifically, you can just tell me your story and I can probably give you a lot of experience about how banks would look at this, how we would look at it, how other lenders would look at it because I've worked with everybody for so many years now. I have a really good background in all those categories. But I think you ought to look for the money first, find out what you can get, how it's gonna work. Um, and that will allow you then to go out to the contracts. And of course, San Diego um, SBDC has tremendous courses and support to teach you how to bid for those contracts. I think you have to know the lender first. And like I said, if you're a startup, I can bring you on board. If we know we're going to get this done, we'll bring you in and we'll wait for you to land your first contract. So that way you have the money done as opposed to landing a large contract and going, oh my, how am I going to fill this contract when I don't have the funds to do it? And then you're scrambling. So I think you have to talk to the lenders first. And of course, even before that, you would talk to the SBDC and the financial consultants that are there who can help as you know we brought up earlier, bring up business plans and for startups or for people who are um, have funds already um, are in business, how they might go about getting certifications and getting everything set up. But the lending is critical. I don't think you can go in and bid on contracts without having the money available. All fantastic. And so I think you can kind of understand here that there's a lot involved in the process. Kind of you, you're going to have to look at the timings in different ways, make sure you understand your financials. That's a lot of what we're here at the SBDC to do is help you understand that. If you're not in government contracting yet, um, Lynn has been posting the information in there. You go to our website. We have the, the on-demand series on getting, you know, learning about government contracting, what that's all about. Then you can work with the advisors. There's certifications you're needing. There's capability statements you're needing. All all of those types of things get together and then if you're actually kind of done a little bit of that understanding what your your order fulfillments are and, and what that all those strategies and processes are so kind of changing tunes a little bit we i want to talk about always some of the, some of the fun parts which are are some of the success cases that maybe you've had and feel free to anonymize it um if you want to but just kind of you know someone that you've helped that you know some of you've given a couple of examples already but uh but these are always kind of fun in terms of hearing about our wins so why don't we go ahead and start with you oscar yeah absolutely let me let me share let me see if i can have someone have a great one but i just want to make sure that i don't provide any more details <laughs> so so the it's a company based out of chicago um they do uh they have a software proprietary software for pharmaceutical compliance um they've been in business for 10 plus years and during the pandemic uh, they secure a big, huge contract with Moderna. Um, so that was a huge boost to their business model. Uh, we were able to participate in the round. Um, it was a mix of equity, debt as well, to revenue-based lenders um, 
got into that deal. We were one of them. We provided the company with around $250,000. And so far, I mean, obviously the, the company has done amazing. 3X, since we provided the, the additional capital, great returns also for their for their equity investors. Um, two years in a row, the company has been in the Inc. 5000 now uh, for more, most successful, highest growth companies in, in nationwide. Um, amazing story we were very fortunate to, to be to be to be a part of that of that business model fantastic that is a great story andrew what about you you always got good stories there you go okay um couple of couple of quick stories so i have a woman-owned business in san diego that was referred to us and in this particular business, they were about a million five. They're in the um, beverage industry. They were in the um, Whole Foods and things to that nature. And when COVID hit, there was a huge demand from some of the biggest players in the country to find production to actually run the, the product to assembly lines, their parties. And um, as it turned out, they were a small player in, in a big pond and there weren't enough people able to do this. And they got pushed out of their... Um, their manufacturer and that left them with virtually no revenue. I mean, it just sort of just stopped the business cold where it was growing. Um, they sort of survived by trying to go to smaller um, third parties, but they really weren't making much money. It was really a difficult two years. And now um, one of the companies they're working with just upgraded with a bunch of new equipment. With the equipment, they have production. Um, they referred into us. And um, now they're negotiating with their vendors and they got a letter of financial commitment and they're on board and we're getting ready to do first funding. We're hoping to get them back from basically no revenue or very little revenue to a couple million fairly quickly. But um, they were never familiar with receivable finance and PO finance model. They are now. And now they see a, a growth thing, um, you know, as far as projections, they think they can get it up to five million now. So um, they're really in good shape. The other one was a disabled vet that um, I was introduced to from the bank five years ago. I wasn't able to help him. He had too much debt. The bank had overextended the line. There wasn't a way to get the deal, but the client kept my card and followed up. Um, they're doing about eight, nine million right now. Um, COVID really put a dent in their business. Um, again, thank God for the uh, PPP program and the 2 million idol he received and he was able to survive. So he didn't go under, he survived. The money went to uh, um, deal with uh, various clients. The bank has now paid off, um, vendors are caught up, um, contracts are getting larger again, his business is picking up. Um, but I ran into, as you guys probably know the word FinTech, they had a couple of um, very high interest lenders <laughs> to sort of bridge him even a little bit more that he needed. Um, one of them, he signed a three-year agreement um, actually, it was an eight-year loan, which was pretty amazing, but a three-year agreement where he could not get out of the loan, period. No way out. Um, <laughs> and so they had a UCC filing that became a, a little bit of a nightmare. And that was the only one I really saw. The other FinTech we're paying off um, this week on our first funding. So we get rid of that guy, which is over 20% interest. Um, so he's happy to get rid of that. He has cash flow. He only needs to fund about 30% of his receivables. So he has really good backup. And, uh, but he needs us for the growth that takes place and the lumpiness of the business. And finally, um, I was able to negotiate with the um, lender who had done this three years, no, no way to get out of it type of thing. And they did subordinate to us. So that allowed us to come in to at least lend him and get him forward. Um, without that, you know, he would have been, you know, potentially a bankruptcy candidate because he wouldn't have the cash flow to make the business work. So that's a good success story. The guy's really happy, kept my card and uh, we got there. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. And DeWitt, what about you? So one recent success story is, uh, and this, this business is a, a municipal contractor. So they service um, counties, cities, the state of California. Um, and this business, they are in the tree care, tree trimming business. Um, previously, they had a small line of credit with a big bank. They had about a $50,000 line of credit. Um, and 2020 was an off year for them. So during COVID, you, you can kind of imagine city buildings, office buildings, everyone's working from home, not 
a real high demand to trim trees and make places look nice and manicured and groomed. So a lot of business from 2020 was delayed or canceled. And then 2021 comes around, things reopen, and all of a sudden this company got busier than ever, trimming trees, doing landscaping work for cities, municipalities, et cetera. Uh, they went to their bank, they said, hey, we're, we have all of these new additional contracts that we've been awarded, we've won. Some of them are even repeat business with <clears throat> various cities and municipalities that we've worked with in the past, uh, but we only have a 50K line of credit. And if we don't get a larger line, we're not going to be able to satisfy all of these contracts. What do we do? And I was referred to them uh, by their CPA. And the CPA wanted them to, to get a much larger line of credit. And I looked at their historical financials. And aside from 2020, everything looked pretty good. Uh, they've only been around for five years. So bear, bear that in mind. Um, but everything looked pretty good. 2021 was a very profitable year for them. And I helped them to obtain a 500,000 line of credit, uh, literally 10 times more than what uh, another bank was willing to provide. Um, and that 500,000, what, what it did for the company, in addition to you know, helping them satisfy these contracts, but the owner of the company in 2020 uh, before all of these delays happened, he was in the process of buying a commercial property to run the business from, and he was going to hire an additional two to four people, uh, but all of that got put on hold. So fast forward to now, they recently became a client over the summer, um, and now since they have a 500k line, the owner is now able to buy a building and move, move all of the staff into a new facility uh, and even hire an additional two to four people. Um, so that that's definitely a, a recent success story that we're all really, really happy with to be able to give them, give a business more money than what another bank was willing to do, help a company to hire more people, buy commercial real estate to run the business from. Uh, and yeah, that's a, a happy new client. Fantastic. And Pete? Yeah, so um, it's recently I have a repeat client I've been working with for, for years. He just got, uh, they do parking lot cleaning and maintenance, property maintenance for, for larger commercial properties. But the, recently they got uh, Home Depot and Walmart both in the same month. So part of that contract was um, a fleet size requirements. So we're talking he had to get about 10 new units in a matter of two weeks. Um, and we were able to get that done for him in a pretty prompt manner. We had a lot of his information because he was a repeat client, so definitely helped out there. And uh, earlier this month, too, we did a uh, rather quick round of funding. I think we got it done inside of a week, 750K for a company that uh, does fertilizer products, grow house products. They're actually preparing to go public, um, but they needed to basically clean some things up before they're planned to really to, to, to really get out there and go public later next year. So we're talking about catching up with suppliers and vendors of sorts, paying down some other high rate debt that they had, um, just really helping them to clean things up. Um, what was unique about that one was just really able to get it done in a very quick time. I mean, inside Monday through Friday, we were having funded 750K. Um, so that was definitely a good success story for us. Fantastic. And Gustavo? Thanks, Danny. Uh, I think our, my favorite story is about the mother and daughter restaurant tours here in City Heights. Uh, during we were able to help them during the the pandemic. Um, they had some very high interest rates. They had financed the construction of their of their backyard, if they will, to their restaurant. Um, of course, everybody at that time was closing their storefronts and kind of opening up beer gardens or, or open space. And so, we realized that their interest rate was very very high. And the reason why I'm starting with the, the loan to refinance their, their outside portion of the restaurant, which we were able to lower to a, a lower interest rate, we we're also able to provide them uh, some assistance because of it so that they can compete for a health and human services contract with the, the county of San Diego. So while they were able to uh, afford better their garden, we were also able to help them um, get the capital injection that they needed to fulfill the contract to provide senior citizens with meals. So, um, you know, it was a very heartwarming opportunity to help someone that maybe was of, of uh, humble means to understand that they were 
um, paying way too much for their improvement of their backyard, if you will, to become a beer garden, and then enable them to, to have the capital enough to fulfill a contract with the county. Uh, so kind of a magic stroke to be able to do both things and keep their company or their restaurant afloat during you know, the COVID pandemic time. Fantastic. And Fernando. Yeah, recent <coughs> success we had, actually, we have a, uh, a honey manufacturer and wholesaler. Uh, it's getting pretty popular now with all the charcuterie boards uh, that people are making. And so um, they we've actually been working with them for, gosh, almost a year now, just trying to, to get this together. It's been an interesting journey. And uh, you know, after about a year of working with them, we, we finally got to a point where we're able to help them with financing. Uh, we just spent a lot of back and forth, a lot of coaching them on, you know, what, what, what we can do and what they need to do and, you know, how to get their house in order on a few things. And, uh, and this month it finally happened. So we've been able to start funding them on some large, uh, invoices and, and POs that they have coming with a, a distributor here and that distributes nationally to like Albertsons, Trader Joe's um whole foods so that's a, a great one that took a lot of time and took a lot of work but in the end uh, the, the partnership paid off and we we're able to get them funded here fantastic that's great to hear so last but not least just uh one or two tips in terms of as they're preparing for accessing contracting capital so capital again for their government contracts since that's the emphasis and just one or two quick tips as we close out we'll start with you andrew all right, tip number one, always speak to SBDC. <laughs> Get to the consultants, um, tell them what you need, where you're headed. And um, there's not just one consultant, there's a lot of consultants. They all have various specialties and um, you probably can speak to two, three or four consultants covering various subjects. So that'd be number one. Number two, um, when you're dealing um, with a lender, whether me or anyone else on the panel, um, you're gonna be asked a lot of questions and, and um, you wanna be truthful in your answers. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm able to underwrite 99% of my clients who come in from that phone call. The 1% of the people who didn't tell me something I'd asked <laughs> and they didn't tell me the truth. And all the lenders here do background. They do everything they need to do before they do their lending. So if there are any issues, past bankruptcies, judgments, credit issues, um, we're very liberal. I probably have one of the most liberal bars here as far as underwriting and bringing you in. But you want to always be upfront with everything because that's going to be necessary to close the deal. And we, you know, when I bring you in, I want to make it happen. Don't want to have any hiccups. And that would be the advice that I would um, give to anybody. Fantastic. And Oscar, one or two tips. Yeah, uh, I would say kind of the same as uh, Andrew. Um, be transparent. Um, usually the process here at Founders First is we have a discovery call. Usually those discovery calls are with me. Um, so I'll, I'll be taking notes. So any, any information that might be different once you submit the information, that's some of the triggers that we usually don't like here at Founders First. Also, another thing would be uh, have your financials in order. Um, not only because it makes our, our job easier, but um, it's something that you definitely need to put some thought into it. It definitely helps you throughout the, um, throughout the year to make better decisions along your business. So have your financials in order, uh, work with a professional accountant, whether you have someone in-house, a CPA, uh, will be some th things that I would definitely recommend in in investing. And I will say just lastly, uh, do your own due diligence process as well. Um, there's a lot of lenders out there, a lot of opportunities. Do your research, um, and, and compare uh, one what offerings to another, and and try to decide what which one makes more sense for you and in, in, in your business. Fantastic. Can you, Pete? One or two tips? Yeah, I, I got one easy one. I, I, I recycle every every time, but it it really is easy for you guys when you are applying when you're getting all your your ducks in a row to go online and make sure all your addresses and phone numbers and all those little things are all up to date. Um, I can't tell you how many times we're processing applications and we do Google you as lenders. I'm sure every single one of you guys do. And um, if we see a, another address, we completely stop what we're doing. Or if we see other ownership information on the secretary of state, maybe there was an old owner that no longer is with the company. We're going to have to make a phone call, stop everything we're doing, and it really slows down the process. So it may only take you 15 to 30 minutes to go online and make sure all that's updated. It'll save a lot of time for underwriting. 
Fantastic. And DeWitt, one or two tips. So first one, definitely talk to the SVDC um, before you apply with anyone. Um, you know, there's a team of experts there that has helped thousands of businesses obtain millions upon millions upon millions of dollars of capital to finance things just like everyone on this call is, is looking for. So talk to them first. Um, next tip after that would be never blindly apply online for any kind of financing. Um, so, you know, hypothetically, if you, you like what one of the lenders here has to say, don't just get on our website and click apply now and then start applying for something. And if you get any offers by email from other lenders that you've never spoken to, and maybe it's an offer that sounds really great, never just apply online or fill out an application online without talking to a real living person first. You know, if you talk to any of the lenders on this call, they're probably going to ask you questions about what you're doing, ask you questions about your business, learn about your business, learn about you, start building a relationship with you. Because at the end of the day, you want to have a relationship with your lender. You know, it, 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 your lender, it should be almost like your one of your business's best friends. In other words, when things are going good, you probably want to have a good lender involved to help you continue financing that growth if you need it. If things aren't going good, you probably also want to have a really good relationship with your lender to help help you navigate through, you know, how do we get back on track? So never apply with, you know, any online lenders. Don't apply just blindly online um, and definitely build, build a relationship with whatever lender you're working with. So it's a, a long-term relationship. Fantastic. And Gustavo, one or two tips. Thank you, Danny. I think um, DeWitt here was, um, was spot on about building a relationship with your banker. Um, but I would, uh, I would add on to that, that um, you, know, you obviously do wanna work with the SBDC or set of counselors because you know, it builds the capacity of, your, of yourselves. Right? You wanna make sure that you're ready to move forward in whatever <clears throat> position you wanna be competitive in. You've gotta you know, take care of the house first. Um, the transparency is very important. I think many of us uh, would appreciate you being very honest in the application process and having everything ready to go. And, and I would just also invite many of you to who are those who are procuring or competing for the first time to build that capacity. And, and whether it's at the SBDC or PTAC or through our programs at Civic Communities um, to learn how to really understand when you're dealing with government, all the ins and outs of compliance. I can't specify that enough. So you know, have your financials ready, build the house ready as well, be ready to, um, to compete appropriately because you know that uh, the foundation is ready. And, um, and then of course, be ready with your financials. The hardest part, I think many of us would agree is, you, know, you, you need a loan quick, yet you don't have your financials in order, right? You have things that are outdated, things that are missing, and then you want us to come with a credit decision. Sometimes that's hard to do, right? So, um, you know, just those are some of my my tips. Fantastic. And, and last but not least, Fernando, one or two tips. Uh, yeah, one, the main one I mentioned earlier, just make sure your contracts are assignable when you when you bid. Um, even if you're not planning on getting financing, if it's, it's a long term contract, I've seen many scenarios where they get awarded, you know, they, they win a contract, then two years later, the contract grows in size, right? And suddenly, they can't manage it. They never checked off the assignability. Then we got to go back and do all the work for that. Um, the other thing is just uh, work, you know, do, do the work ahead of time. Uh, half the people that come to me, their hair is on fire trying to get funded in a week or immediately. And, and that's going to create a scenario where you might have to take a loan that's not, you know, not the right loan, right? Because you, you have an emergency and you need to get cash right away. Um, so plan ahead, start having those discussions before you ever need any capital, uh, you wanna just have those discussions and figure out what you have to do to put yourself in place to get funded. Fantastic. Thanks, Fernando. And thanks to all of our panelists, uh, with Andrew, Fernando, Oscar, Pete, Gustavo, and DeWitt who had to drop off. I appreciate everybody. Again, we're the Small Business Development Center and uh, Ali will be emailing at a recording. We also have uh, Meet the Buyers is coming back in person. 
uh, both October uh, 20th and November 15th uh, to, to kind of be able to meet a bunch of buyers and procurers and so forth as well. So we certainly look forward to, to all of that. So have a great, uh, great Friday and a great weekend. And uh, here we are in October next tomorrow. So you all take care. Bye-bye.